Good afternoon. My name is Gerald Caden, and I'm a professor of urban planning and design here at the Graduate School of Design, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the school, uh, as well as on behalf of the various sponsors that I'll describe in a moment for this uh, quite remarkable assembly of people that we'll be hearing later today, tonight, and tomorrow. The basic idea of this conference is a simple one, which is something we all know, something that we all feel, but something that we have to remind ourselves about in an age of the digital, which is simply that physical, tangible, material, corporeal, public space still matters. And uh, it didn't really take 2011 to remind us of that, but who couldn't be reminded of that with what occurred in Tahrir Square or Zuccotti Park? So there's no live streaming of this conference, uh, in part uh, for technical reasons and in part because uh, place does, in fact, uh, matter. <laughs> we will be addressing the subject matter over the next day and a half through seven panels. And I won't rehearse the topics today or tomorrow because you have programs. And indeed, we won't even be providing uh, audio biographies by our moderators of speakers because you have all of that very interesting information. Your participation, that is to say those of you who are not speakers or moderators, is encouraged. It's not mandatory, but we've tried to set up this room in a way that there would be more conversation and we genuinely encourage that. Uh, the way the panels are set up is that each speaker will have generally 20 minutes uh, to speak directly to you. Um, and then there will be 15 minutes of engagement with the audience in conversation. Um, and then finally 15 minutes of discussion between the moderator and speakers. So we get to the participants of audience sooner than later. Tomorrow there is a lunch. Uh, you do have to pay for it, but it's been put down to a fairly inexpensive price. I don't know exactly what it is, but there will be a lunch that you'll be able to purchase tomorrow uh, between 12 and 1 o'clock, which is our lunchtime. Because conferences can sometimes fade out at the end in terms of an audience, I want to take this opportunity right now to thank the following entities uh, and individuals. Uh, first, uh, in addition to the Harvard Graduate School of Design, the other sponsor of this conference is the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and the Environment. It's been a long-standing collaboration on a variety of issues, climate change, now public space. And I particularly want to thank my partner in crime, Hank, Hank Ovink. There you are. You'll see Hank Ovink, but uh, I want to thank the Dutch Ministry. They've been terrific. Uh, there are also co-sponsors. Uh, they're not sponsors, but they're co-sponsors or they're supporters of the conference, and in particular, the Rachel Dorothy Tanner Memorial Lectureship Fund. I don't know if a member of the family is here right now, but in any event, we thank them. The Loeb Fellowship Program, and uh, Jim Stockard, I see Jim over there, and Sally Young, terrific supporters of everything interesting at the school, and indeed some of the speakers are uh, former and current Loeb Fellows, and that's just a testament to this incredible program that we have here. Advocates for privately owned public space at the Municipal Arts Society of New York is a supporter. Uh, I'm part of that. Alexis Taylor over there is part of that. And we work very closely with the City of New York, even though they're not supporters of this in terms of sort of directly, but they are, and Melissa, thank you for that. Uh, of course, I can't imagine any conference without its speakers and moderators. They'll be thanked by all of you over the course of the next uh, day and a third. And finally, uh, and really, I don't want to say most importantly, but absolutely critically, a conference like this can't, of course, occur without those people who are not so behind the scenes. They're really running it. And Ben Prosky and Chantal Blakely and uh, Emily Thompson, um, all three of them have been absolutely terrific collaborators on this, and I'm very, very grateful for everything you've done to make this possible. So, without further ado, let's begin. Susan. Torah, Torah, Torah. Welcome to Can Public Space Be Privately Provided? I'm Susan Chin, the Executive Director of the Design Trust for Public Space and moderator for this panel. 
The Design Trust brings design innovation to New York City's public spaces to create a more dynamic and sustainable city. In this panel, we'll debate, and I think I've left some books on the back table. Um, in this panel, we'll debate the pros and cons of who provides and maintains public space. But first, what makes public space public? The general public frequently blurs the boundaries between public and private realms. Public space is defined not only by being publicly owned and funded, but also by its public use. As we increasingly depend on the private sector to create, own, manage parks, open space, and plazas, we find public space often has more variety than what was solely provided by the public sector, a higher level of professionalism, cleanliness, and services, different rules than we might assume, are, than we might assume which are more restrictive, but in some cases, such as Zuccotti Park, they provided more freedom. This panel of experts will present a range of perspectives on this complex topic. A huge thanks goes to Professor Caden for organizing and chairing this timely conference. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, in order of their presentations, Adrian Benepe, Senior Vice President and Director of City Park Development at the Trust for Public Land and former commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Second, Holly Light, executive director of New Yorkers for Parks and former deputy commissioner at the New York City Housing Preservation Development Department. And last, Professor Gerald Caden, Frank Backus Williams Professor of Urban Planning and Design at the GSD. Adrian? Thank you, and uh, good evening. Uh, what a pleasure and an honor it is to kick this off. Um, I'm Adrian Benepe, um, and it's a pleasure to be up here in Cambridge um, from New York. There are a number of transplanted New Yorkers up here, and if you see people wandering around lost, it's one of us. Um, so we're going to go just quickly into this. Uh, it's a really interesting topic, and we really start, when we think about the modern park system, with the 1930s, and um, it's the period of the greatest expansion of the park system in New York City and really around the country when you have the, the WPA. And um, I, you'll, there will be a bit of a New York orientation here and that's just simply because I spent the better part of 35 years working in New York City, particularly in the New York City park system. But the, the WPA in the 1930s ushered in a dramatic expansion and renovation of the park system and the, the development of a lot of models for what parks and playgrounds should look like. In addition, I point out to you this, and this is sort of an important theme to think about. This is one of the many parkies, uh, the professional parks maintenance workers who were sort of born out of the depression and the civil service. And then of course this, the landscape architects, the construction supervisors, the surveyors, all of the civil service professionals who made up the cadre of 2,000 uh, um, people in the design and construction division of the, of the parks department during this great flourishing. And of course, those 2,000 architects and landscape architects and engineers, the creme de la creme of their profession who got jobs, built this. They built the Aquacade at the World's Fair, and they built the Rotunda at Riverside Park and the whole West Side Improvement. The, the 11 Olympic swimming pools that opened in the summer of 1936, the hottest summer in the history of New York City. And of course, Orchard Beach, the, the great works of the WPA. Um, all of that was done with federal money, and that's an important point to remember. The, the, the great expansion of the New York City park system and many of the national parks and city parks around the country took place with federal tax dollars, not with city tax dollars. That's a very important point, which I'll come back to. But there were some other traditions in New York and in other cities of philanthropic largesse, of uh, leading citizens who were giving gifts to the city. And one of the earliest such gifts was the Naumburg Bandshell in the early 1920s in Central Park. Uh, it was a sort of neoclassical intrusion into the uh, Victorian landscape of Olmsted and Vox. And in fact, f uh, not too long ago, it was, they wanted to take it down and bring back the uh, sort of Victorian Gothic bandstand. Um, there was a lawsuit that prevented that, but one of the acts that played, it's hard to believe that the Jefferson Airplane played 
and the Central Park Bandshell had a free show. And of course, the Wallman Rink in Central Park, the Lasker Rink at the northern end of Central Park, and, and many others. These were gifts, uh, often with a, a very large private gift that would be matched with some public money. And this was really the, sort of the limit of private participation in public parks for many decades. By the, the a long period of decline started in the 1950s. The federal money, of course, disappeared by the end of the 1930s. And, and Robert Moses, who was Parks Commissioner for 26 years, started complaining by the 1940s. And of course, he had World War II, and uh, the money simply dropped away. A long period of decline led um, by the 1970s, when New York City almost went bankrupt, um, to a spe spectacular decline of the city park system. Um, these images uh, were sort of typical of the New York City park system, and it's the park system I encountered when I first started working for the Parks Department, and there was this series of investigative articles in New York Times in, in 1980. But 1980 was also a year that things started to turn around, and um, they started to turn around with the private sector at early, another early uh, sort of mingling of the private sector and public sector happened on Park Avenue. You know, in, in fact, the, um, the first public-private partnership for public space in New York was not the Central Park Conservancy, though many people think it was. It was on Park Avenue where in 1945 um, private citizens got involved, um, first to sort of memorialize the young men who had died in World War II, and they started a tree lighting tradition uh, to put up Christmas trees and light them up. And then in the 1950s, Mrs. Lasker, who also gave the Lasker rink, uh, who was an advocate for urban beautification, said, we want to have flowering trees and flowers, and thus began a tradition of complete private support for the, the flowers and trees on Park Avenue. And that was really one of the earliest sort of creations of, of, not, of private support for, for public space in New York. And then, of course, comes Central Park, um, really the, the great example of a public-private partnership for park and what has become a model for many such models around the country. Central Park, of course, like all the other parks, had fallen into a terrible state of decline. This is what typically Central Park looked like. This was the mall, that's uh, the band shell off there to the right. Um, the, uh, all of the horticulture, there was no horticulture being practiced. Everything was covered with graffiti. This was the boathouse at the Harlem Mirror at the north end of the park. It had been built in the 1930s as a, as a boathouse and a snack bar, turned into a disco briefly, and then torched by the disco owner when it wasn't working very well. And this was the park that I encountered when I started working for the Parks Department in 1979. Now, right at about this time, some interesting things happened. Um, things had gotten so desperate that um, it was, had been suggested that the National Park Service was the only entity capable of running a park. And it was seriously put forward that the National Park Service should federalize Prospect Park. At the same time, Professor Savas at Columbia University did a study of sort of the management of Central Park and made some recommendations that it shouldn't be managed by a series of operational silos, but it should be managed by one entity, perhaps in some kind of a public-private partnership, which had authority over the, the design, the construction, the maintenance, the programming, and all of those things. And that study was taken very seriously. And, um, uh, other things happened. The economy began to turn around. The city had been rescued from bankruptcy. Uh, Ed Koch was elected mayor. He appointed a, a bright young man uh, named Gordon Davis who knew nothing about parks, had, had, didn't have a single thing of parks in his background, and he turned out to be only the most inventive park commissioner of the, of the modern era. And <clears throat> one of the very bright things he did was turn to a woman named Betsy Barlow, uh, now Elizabeth Barlow Rogers, who was running the Central Park Task Force, and um, say, I'd like you to run Central Park, and you figure it out. And didn't give her any particular powers to do it, and she had to figure it out. And she, she got together with um, three inf influential New Yorkers, uh, George Soros, Arthur Ross, and Richard Gilder. And they said, we need to follow the same model that they have for all the great cultural organizations, for the museums, for the cultural institutions, for the performing arts halls, and get leading New Yorkers to save this park, because clearly, you know, government is not ready to save the park. Uh, by itself. They, they need leading New Yorkers to help. And the, so you had, for the first time, government saying, welcoming in influential New Yorkers and saying, we need your help. And you guys sort of figure it out, we'll be here. But the, the thing that I want to reinforce is, at all times, the Parks Commissioner Gordon Davis and the mayor said, you know, you can do this thing, but remember it's a city park. 
So this is the, uh, in fact, the park that I encountered in the summer, just to make this personal for a second, in the spring of 1979, I was recently out of college, and um, through a series of uh, um, interesting coincidences, I ended up getting a job as a park ranger. And this was the sheep meadow in uh, 1979, and that's me um, standing near the sheep meadow, um, giving directions to people. And then that fall, uh, the city put some money into putting new sod in the sheep meadow, and this is what it turned into. And my job that fall was to stand there in that uniform and tell people why they could no longer play touch football or soccer, and that this would be a passive use lawn, that there would be one piece of grass in the entire city of New York where dogs couldn't go and you couldn't do sports, where you could actually let your baby crawl and the baby wouldn't eat you know, a roach, I mean, and I mean that kind of roach, or, a, or the other kind of roach too. <laughs> or a piece of broken glass, you know, that, and that was Central Park. So, and um, the Central Park Conservancy had no power at all, it had no legal authority to do any of this, and it just started doing things. So it hired young horticultural interns straight out of college and said, we need to start doing horticulture again. And they started, one of the f very first things they did was remove all of the graffiti, hundreds of thousands of square feet of graffiti. It was covering every surface in the park and said, you know, we're gonna get rid of it and make sure it doesn't come back, and gradually took on more and more of the responsibilities for the park. So um, the great lawn, as it used to look, where um, when, you don't, when you just play sports all day long and you don't give it a rest, and then as it was restored um, in the mid-1980s with a two-year wait to get the grass to grow, and now it can be used for sports and for just hanging out on a beautiful day. And then, for, so for 15 years, the Central Park Conservancy and the city of New York lived in sin. They were they're cohabiting, cohabitating, but they finally decided they needed to get married. By this time, the Central Park Conservancy was virtually running the entire park, and they were doing it on a handshake, or not even a handshake. <clears throat> and so Mayor Giuliani at the time, with parks, then Parks Commissioner Henry Stern leaning over him, Betsy Barlow on the right, the current Central Park Administrator on the far right, Doug Wonski, and a, a group of um, other members of the board got together and signed this historic agreement, which effectively gave the Conservancy the responsibility for managing the park under terms of a very carefully spelled out contract, so it's essentially a license agreement, a contract for, the, for a nonprofit organization to run the park on behalf of the city and to receive a fee, a management fee, almost as if they were managing a co-op or a condo, but a very modest fee for, for managing the whole park. So this was this, um, this great period of flowering of the park and uh, many, Landscape architects, I should give credit, a shout out to landscape architects, Marianne Kramer, Judith Heinz, Bruce Kelly, and Phil Winslow, who were the pioneering landscape architects who oversaw this spectacular restoration of the park as a landscape, and that was a very important point. So the same approach was taken to Prospect Park. Or just a year or two after Betsy Barlow took over for Central Park, a woman named Tupper Thomas um, from um, Minneapolis, who had moved to New York, and Betsy was from San Antonio. Uh, they're, they're both sort of irrepressible with their energy. She, she uh, launched the Prospect Park Alliance. Uh, similarly, they started to take over more and more maintenance of Prospect Park and restored this other great work of Olmsted and Vox. And here you can see the, uh, the old Kate Wallman rink and the brand new, um, just about completed, a lakeside center designed by Todd Williams and Billy Shin. And, um, Christian Zimmerman, who is a landscape architect, who res beautifully restored the landscape around the lake behind it. So this project is sort of a typical public-private partnership. It's a $70 million new facility, state-of-the-art architecture, green building, and about half of the money is private and half of it public. A very complicated, very successful project. And so in some ways, the Central Park Conservancy and Prospect Park Alliance were the sort of the creation, and they begat many, many other uh, similar partnerships. Uh, shortly thereafter, a different model, and this now you come to a different model from the straight philanthropic model to the business improvement district model. Bryant Park, as many of you know, was a needle park and um, a place you only went if you wanted to buy drugs for the most part. It was dangerous, it was dilapidated, it was at the very heart of the city behind the um, New York Public Library, 6th Avenue is here, 5th Avenue is here, 42nd Street is here. So at the heart of the city, you had a public space that people didn't want to go into. And the first, as a business improvement district, the Bryant Park Restoration was created, later became the Bryant Park Corporation. Um, they, at first, subsisted mainly on fees that were collected from the property owners in the buildings around Bryant Park. 
And then I realized that they could do better by having events and having restaurants and cafes and things, provide a service and make some money. So now the Bryant Park of today, it's, um, you'd say standing room only, but everybody has a chair, so it's sitting room only on a, on a summer lawn, and it's full of events. A free ice skating rink, a winter um, holiday market, but here you start to get sort of like, all right, to, to, to make this free skating rink, you have to have this very commercial thing. You know, what's the trade-off? Is that good or bad? And it's a sort of a constant state of tension between the city and, and the Bryant Park Corporation about what is the right mix of the, the money that you need to run this place. And by the way, there's not a penny of city money that goes into running Bryant Park. It's all from, from earned revenue and some modest fees. So that's one model, and there's some other business improvement districts that take care of a few other parks, but this is really the, sort of the, the main one in New York. Um, a different model at the Riverside Park Fund. And um, Charles McKinney, who was the first administrator of the park, who's sitting in our audience, also a landscape architect, was the first administrator of the park. And this was one where you had the Friends of Riverside Park created primarily as a volunteer organization, uh, neighborhood-based, to lend volunteer support to the park with a separate executive director and a park administrator working together. And it worked quite well for 20 years, never at the scale of Central Park. Um, Central Park is now a $30 million a year operation. Riverside Park is about a two or $3 million a year operation. But nonetheless, this, this great uh, hybrid landscape of, of Olmsted and Moses came together and these burnt, worn out soccer fields were replaced. Well, this was actually an old asphalt playground replaced with a synthetic turf field. Riverside South, Park South gets built. And this, the old days of the Fireman's Monument being covered with graffiti and sort of a scary place where an urban sort of vigilante movie goes away. And now the, the, the two things have been joined. The Riverside Park Fund has become the Riverside Park Conservancy, and the park administrator runs both organizations. And so you start to see that various models in various parks. There are about a dozen parks in New York City that have a public-private partnership of some significance, then things that are sort of umbrella organizations for the historic house museums. The City Parks Foundation provides funding for programming aimed primarily at children and arts programs in underserved neighborhoods. Of course, New Yorkers for Parks does not uh, support a specific park, but is an advocate for parks in general, and often in an adversarial way when they think that things are not exactly right. But most, their main job is supporting the fact that New York should have great public parks. Uh, so this is, these are some of the groups the, that you know, the Central Park Conservancy and the Alliance begat. And then you come to a, a whole different model in the late 90s and the early uh, 21st century, which is public-public partnerships. Brooklyn Bridge Park, of course, the old industrial water frontier, no longer needed for piers and shipping. It could have become condos. The neighborhood thought that was not such a great idea, advocated for a park. And I will point out also in our audience is Mariana Koval, who was the, the first uh, executive director of the Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy, a, a, a private sector partner of the two governmental entities who worked to create Brooklyn Bridge Park. And Brooklyn Bridge Park has now evolved, so it's pretty much all of this now, all greened up, a spectacular new design. And there's a different model now for revenue. So this former Port Authority pier area, which used to derive revenue for the state of New York and New Jersey, is now a public park, $400 million in public funds invested in creating this park. And they set aside some sites, about 10% of the total area along the edge, where buildings either existed, there are some existing buildings, or would be built on some of the smaller sites, residential buildings and hotels, to create revenue to support the $16 million a year that this park is going to need. So that's one model. And um, somewhat controversial in aspects, but it seems so far to be working. And there's about $4 million a year coming in revenue, and the park is about two-thirds done. So the, um, th that waterfront park, uh, is heralded as a great success. In fact, the, develop, the greening of the old post-industrial waterfront is celebrated by Nikolai Urasov in the Times uh, as being one of the great successes, one of the great legacies of the Bloomberg administration. The same kind of model applies at Hudson River Park, where the revenue from various piers is supposed to support this spectacular park that lines the west side of Manhattan. This is what, the, what is now the park used to look like. Uh, but there you start to have some a little bit of tension because there isn't enough revenue coming from one of the sites and a big debate going on now about how to, whether to change the law to allow a residential building on one of the large piers there. 
Uh, and then the newest, the newest hybrid, what I call grassroots activism on steroids. The High Line, of course, love this picture. It's like a model railroad set. Look how clean and organized everything is. The train coming out of the building, so cool. Uh, but the High Line in its old days, and then it's, I guess, you could say these are the salad days in some ways. But this was going to be torn down. Um, the, the mayor of New York wanted to tear it down. All the adjacent property owners said, it's a blight. I'll never be able to make any money with my property. And then the neighborhood rises up, Josh David and Robert Hammond. I'm sure you've heard all about it. The rest is history. Highland has saved $150 million public investment in creating this elevated public park. It now receives about 5 million visits a year. It's one of the major tourist destinations. And the city, having done a major investment in rezoning in this area, has already seen $2 billion in economic investment in new buildings alongside the High Line and has already more than recouped in new, uh, net new taxes all of the money it's, it, it originally invested. So it's a very interesting kind of model. And the friends of the High Line who run it uh, pay for the entire expenses of operating it except for the security, which the city does. Another kind of grass, a more uh, traditional grassroots movement was to save the Bronx River. This is what it looks, looked like in its more bucolic northern stretches. But the Bronx River Alliance was formed uh, based on a consortium of neighborhood-based environmental activists. They got together, uh, a, an administrator was appointed, a nonprofit Bronx River Alliance was created. And today the Bronx River is um, largely restored with beautiful waterfront parks along the side of it. An example of, of a, of a grass, grassroots-based uh, effort to do public-private partnership. If, frankly, it will never attract $100 million from their neighbors. But it is, they are able to leverage a lot of federal funding and other funding with small amounts of private funding. So it's a, a very different model. Then you go across the country. Um, Clyde Warren Park. This is the sunken highway that runs through the middle of downtown Dallas, separating the arts district from a residential district. And in a public-private partnership st started sort of in the 1960s, but not re- um, Actually, the idea was proposed in the early 2000s, and then there are some grants, and the $110 million project covers over this bleak stretch of sunken highway with a brand new park, joins the two neighborhoods, and um, the city of Dallas owns it. It's managed by the Woodall Rogers Park Foundation and an interesting model of a public-private partnership to solve a real urban blight here in Dallas. Same thing in the Olmsted Design Piedmont Park in Atlanta. This is what Piedmont Park looked like, whether the abandoned swimming pool and the kudzu vine covering the old, some of the older structures here, too much of it being used for parking and a, a, essentially an abandoned landscape. And then all of those things, the kudzu removed, the swimming pool restored, the parking lot turned into a, a beautiful area of the park. And right next to downtown Atlanta, a, a, a nicely revived public park with a public-private partnership. Similarly, in Houston, Texas, where you can see the befores and afters with a public-private partnership in Houston, Texas. Again, much of this based on some of the pioneering work in New York. Uh, Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. I highlight some of the more successful parks conservancies, and not every city can do it. You need to have a, a, a critical mass of people interested in, in working and living and saving the downtown. But um, even in Louisville, two interesting examples, the Friends of the Olmsted Parks who create the, Olmsted, the Louisville Olmsted Parks Conservancy, and then the 21st Century Parks, creating a whole new group, group of parks where they're um, going to be creating, uh, with $120 million, a, a brand new bunch of parks worthy of Olmsted and Vox, including, in this case, you have a 60 or $70 million gift from one family who is sort of leading the creation of this park. So it's a, a totally different model. One, only one self, slightly self-promotional project to talk about here. The um, wonderful example of the High Line in um, New York is being replicated to some extent around the country. So uh, similarly, an, an elevated freight rail line in Chicago being turned into a linear park with a design by Michael Van Valkenburg Associates. And this, the Trust for Public Land is the partner here. We're leading the private fundraising campaign with the Friends of the Bloomingdale Trail and working with the city of Chicago and Chicago Parks and Recreation to create something that will be similar to the High Line, but uh, much more recreational. So those are um, some of the examples. Here you can see some dollars and cents. In New York alone, $166 million in fiscal year 11 in private donations. 
and what it gets raised for, for just annual operating support, capital endowments, others, um, the kinds of programming some of these partners offer. And then, you know, much in some ways more valuable than the money which is given is the one and a half million hours of volunteer labor that come into parks. In fact, most parks do not get significant money but get volunteer labor. So what are the lessons? Um, the benefits of public-private partnerships are, are really quite fundamental. Private funding gives you a lot of flexibility to do things that you can't do with government funding. Alternative management structures can be tried out and experimented with. One of the best things that happened in Central Park was the development of zone gardeners, putting a gardener in charge of every sort of four acre area so you can have one person overseeing each piece of the landscape. Private money can do a great job of leveraging public funding. You put a you know, million dollars in of private money, you can extract two or three million dollars in public money to get a project going. This is really important, perhaps one of the most important points of public-private partnerships. Governments come and go. You get good mayors, you get mayors who care about other things, you get mayors who care about parks, budgets come and go. Not until you had the advent of the private-public partnerships did you have a conti continuity of interest and people holding government's feet to the fire. And so it's unlikely you'll ever see a decline of parks as you saw again in the 1970s because so many people are so invested uh, as citizens in the life of the parks and you get this platform for citizen involvement. The government had a monopoly in all parks for many years, and now you have citizens involved, sort of challenging government to do a better job. And what are the sort of assets and drawbacks, and how do you make these work? It's very important if you're going to give management responsibility to have a contract with performance-based measurements, and the city must have board membership. Um, local government has to have the final say on policy and what happens in the parks. Uh, on the other hand, you want to empower volunteers, you want them to be involved. Very delicate balance. Uh, there are some council members who say, we have to have rules for how conservancies function. The risk there is that you start to impinge on the entrepreneurial spirit, and the board members say, you know, I don't need a place, I don't need to give my money with a place with so many rules, I'll go you know, give money to the hospital or to the opera or something. So you, you have to sort of, that's a delicate balance which the government people have to work on to maintain, make sure people stay interested in this. How are they doing, Ed Koch, how am I doing? Um, I think they're doing pretty well. Uh, somebody once said to me, how can I replicate the Central Park Conservancy in my city? And I said, it's very simple. Make sure you have a really great you know, park in the middle of your city and make sure that that park is surrounded by 30-story apartment buildings, and that in those 30-story apartment buildings are millionaires and billionaires who are extremely philanthropic, <laughs> stacked up on top of each other. You can replicate the Central Park Conservancy, and in fact, you can't really replicate the Central Park Conservancy. You can do variations on the themes, and nor should you try. The beauty of them is they're different models. Are they, so are they replicable? Absolutely, um, but you should be making sure that you have a, f a very flexible idea about what they are and being open to new ideas is important. And uh, with that, I uh, conclude. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Adrian and I rode up on the train together and discovered that we have uh, Many of the same images, and so uh, I guess the good news is that we are quite consistent in talking about the history of uh, New York parks um, and how we got to where we are today. So I will try to be a little quick in the, uh, in the introduction, but um, Gerald asked all of us to think a little bit about how parks and the public park system started, and um, a lot of this sort of came out of some of the uh, reaction against as pe more and more people moving to the city, especially in the age of industrialization, realizing that cities were becoming pretty miserable places to live, and government starting to think about how to, in, in an altruistic way, I suppose, uh, make them more livable. And so Central Park was completed in 1873 and was sort of a, a predecessor of the City Beautiful movement that was really the 1890s, 1900, of trying to build beautiful buildings and beautiful public realm um, for the citizens of cities. These are uh, all pictures of Central Park. Um, and then, as Adrian talked about, we moved into this era of parkland expansion in New York and elsewhere through the WPA program and through the force of personality of Robert Moses in New York. Uh, he was the, the commissioner of parks from 1934 to 1960, and in that time, 
um, built a tremendous number of parks, both for the state but also for the city, and moved it out into the outer boroughs, which was a huge addition for New York to, to move out and have meaningful parks. This is Orchard Beach in the Bronx, um, and Adrian showed this as well, Story Pool in Queens. Um, and then we hit the 60s, 70s, and when cities in general had massive disinvestment, and that uh, trickled quickly into the park system. You also saw this Harlem Mirror picture before. These are all Central Park uh, photos during the 70s, um, and other parks too. Uh, not anyone's favorite place to be at this point in time. And then we moved into uh, the idea of public-private partnerships. And um, as Adrian said, Central Park Conservancy was certainly one of the early ones and uh, one of the best-funded ones. Uh, this is the founding of it and also a large gift to it in the uh, Dinkins administration later. And then where that has led to today is a concept that is rather popular in the Bloomberg administration, which is the self-sustaining park. Um, this is kind of the concept that many of the flagship parks, the new flagship parks in New, in New York, um, have are operating under, which is the concept that the, the city would put much capital into, into building out parks, although the High Line also had a large influx of private funding in the build out as well. And then the concept is that over time, these should be able to operate in a self-sustaining way. So for the High Line, um, the city, the Parks Department provides some uh, security officers and the city is in charge of maintaining the infrastructure of the actual trestle and, and, and the, the High Line uh, foundation. But the, the friends of the High Line maintain it, concessions they are allowed, which is a somewhat unusual, although not unique situation that they will be able to keep the revenue of concessions in the park. Um, but they're basically ultimately supposed to operate this without uh, the, city's, the city's involvement in the city money. Brooklyn Bridge Park, Adrian also talked about, is another example of the self-sustaining park. The idea being uh, that this, this was modeled out in a, in a very specific economic way in order to be sustained by the buildings uh, that are built around the park um, and by event revenues, if that, if that is applicable. So what are some of the concerns about the model? Um, the first one and the biggest one is probably privatization, um, which is the concern that if you're allowing a lot of private money and private funders to run a park, are they going to take it over and is the public going to be robbed of that public space? Um, one of the, I think, arguably most egregious examples in New York of this is uh, Damrush Park, which is a park on the west side of Manhattan. Um, Lincoln Center had operates Damrush Park, and as part of a, a large effort to pump money into Lincoln Center as a cultural institution that was failing, this park has been used essentially as an event space, and the revenue supports Lincoln Center, um, which is great for Lincoln Center, and Lincoln Center does have some lovely open space, public spaces of its own, as you can see on the top, but for this is not sort of a place in the middle of nowhere. This is a, a a populated residential neighborhood. This is one of the few public parks right there. And it's essentially, people will vary on how much of the year it's taken over by private events, but the neighbors have told us 10 months, let's say it's at least the majority of the year. Um, Big Apple Circus operates in the whole park for um, from October through January. Fashion Week has been relocated from Bryant Park. Adrian talked about Bryant Park. There was a lot of pushback on Bryant Park having too many events, and Fashion Week got moved up, which Fashion Week is actually more than a week. It's a couple weeks in the year. That's been moved now here, and in fact, when that happened, uh, 67 trees had to be taken down in order to accommodate um, the infrastructure for Fashion Week. Um, and then there's other special events throughout the year, and so this is essentially, now some people have argued, well, it wasn't a great park to begin with. Um, that's not untrue, but that doesn't necessarily mean it should be taken over um, by private events for 10, let's call it seven to 10 months of the year. So I think this for, in New York, is a, is a big example. This is under, lit under litigation um, for alienation of, of park land. A similar example um, where we, coordinate with our uh, sister group in Chicago, and um, they have a lot of concerns in Grant Park, um, the Lollapalooza, 
Festival has been allowed to take over uh, Grant Park in the summer every year. And there's a couple interesting things about this. Um, one is that other events have not been allowed. And so there's this feeling of kind of favoritism. Why does this event get chosen and other events don't? Um, it always results in tons of damage, and that's kind of accepted at this point. The festival is responsible for, for the restoration, which one year was as much as a million dollars in damage to the park, but there's no real time frame for when that has to be done. And so that has dragged out um, in some years. There have been portions of the park that have been cut off due to, due to damage um, for ex extensive periods. So it's much, it ends up meaning that the privatization goes longer than just the period of the festival. Uh, Millennium Park, another example in Chicago, when this, this was built um, with a lot of private money, it was very successful fundraising for the park, um, and especially early when they were still trying to raise more money for the, for the build out of it, um, corporate sponsors were allowed to close off sections and have private events, and so um, there, were, there was an event where this area, and this area around this piece of art, um, the Bean or whatever it's called, Cloud Gate, um, is particularly attractive. So there was a period where for an entire day and night, Toyota was able to close this off and people couldn't access that area. They got a lot of pushback on that. Then they started making them only night events where corporations could essentially pay to, cut, to, to use this space and other people were not allowed in it during that time. Another element of Millennium Park, and I think reasonable minds differ on if this is an offensive thing or not an offensive thing, but they have um, sold off pretty much every inch of uh, that space, and this really kind of moves us into the issue of commercialization. So even if you want to argue that these spaces are not privatized, um, a lot of them are sort of now, it's a, it's a more common model. This is also the case at Lincoln Center, where spaces are being um, sold off for naming rights and things like that, and, and the question is, does that sort of cheapen the park user's experience if everywhere you're kind of accosted by the names of corporations and, and logos and other things as opposed to just feeling like this is truly the public, the public realm. Um, this is another example in Chicago on the left. On the lakefront, a, a private individual, I guess an entrepreneurial individual, told the city that uh, he would give them free trash cans if he could then at, sell advertisement on the trash cans. This was a pilot project that was done for a year, and at the end of the year, um, there had been a lot of pushback, and they um, canned the program, so to speak. <laughs> I just thought of that right now. Um, this, uh, this on the right um, was a, a uh, RFP that was released last year uh, for New York, and um, I don't think this was the Parks Department's idea. This was a required revenue. The, the Budget Department it has consistently been pushing all agencies, including parks, to come up with more revenue, and it's not always easy to do that. And so um, I, I won't speak for Adrian, but I would say somewhat under duress, the Parks Department had to release an RFP, and it offered the opportunity for corporations to sponsor dog runs, um, and put their logo on dog runs. I've never actually seen a structure like that in a dog run, but um, put their logos on dog runs um, or on basketball courts. Um, my understanding is that after extending the deadline for this several times, there were not satisfactory responses, and so um, this too got canned, and it has happily not happened, so we didn't actually have to have the philosophical debate about it, but I think um, a lot of people were really concerned about what this would mean, and also the slippery slope. Okay, maybe I can see an Alpo sign and a dog run, but what does that mean next? Are we just selling off piece by piece in our parks? Another big issue in New York, and this has uh, come up a lot if you follow uh, the papers, there's a lot of discussion now about does this lead to inequity? Because not every park is gonna be able to raise a hundred million dollars. Um, this press conference on the right was a recent gift by that gentleman, John Paulson, of a hundred million dollars to Central Park, which um, created a lot of debate um, in New York about why is this all going to Central Park, which is already so well funded. Seventy percent of their budget come from individual donors. Um, why, why is that getting all of this money and the rest of the system uh, is left out of that? 
and there's the rest of the system. So um, we are very focused in New Yorkers for Parks on neighborhood parks, and we do report cards on the conditions, maintenance conditions of neighborhood parks citywide. Um, I give the Parks Department a ton of credit for, despite budget cuts year after year until this year, um, really doing more with less, literally, but nonetheless, you cannot keep up with 29,000 acres of parkland um, with limited resources if you're not getting that money wider spread. So right now, I think if we could argue that the private money that comes in is completely offset and that public money then is not going into any of those parks at all and is, and is being shifted to neighborhood parks, that's one um, argument. On the other hand, when people are giving private money to parks, they don't want to feel like they're just replacing public funds. And so often there's a restriction that you have to baseline what their current public budget is and then this money will augment that. And so if that has been a difficult um, debate and balance between just taking the public money out, which I think is what a lot of public advocates would say should be done, um, and what the funders expect, which is that they aren't just sort of bailing the government out. Um, another inequity question is, um, it, it comes up with Brooklyn Bridge Park, which is, that's great that these lovely waterfront market rate um, apartments can support a park in Brooklyn Heights, but it could never happen in a low market area. And so are you saying to us that we are only building new parks in neighborhoods that are wealthy that can support it through real estate? And um, that has been a debate about this. Um, the Bloomberg administration has put large capital money into other flagship parks in other parts of the city, but when you look at where new parks have, have been created, a lot of them, because of this self-sustaining park model, have been in places where either commercial rents, um, as in the case of Bryant Park, which is in Midtown Manhattan, or here, the residential um, can, can support it because of the market in those places. So it, is, it does beg the question, are we going to be able to find a structure for doing new parks in neighborhoods that don't have hot markets? And then my last point that I just hit on is, is the pragmatism of this. Does this self-sustaining park model actually work? Um, and I don't think we know at this point. Um, the furthest along in New York is Hudson River Park, which Adrian mentioned. Um, this was started uh, as a baby of Governor Pataki and Mayor Giuliani. Now um, we're in the Bloomberg administration, and he really doesn't take ownership of this park. It's not one of the parks that he spent a lot of time investing in. And this park has become somewhat of an orphan. And the problem is that some of the early estimates for the operational costs that were supposed to be self-sustaining dealt with day-to-day -day operations but did not dig into um, capital maintenance over the long term, particularly of a waterfront park. So we have pilings on piers that are now deteriorating, and those were not accounted for in some of the estimates on cost. So Pier 40 is now a huge debate. Adrian mentioned that there's now proposals to go back and think about whether we build housing or offices on Pier 40 to generate enough revenue. Um, this, the, these piers were in big trouble. We were talking almost $100 million of pier damage and pier repairs needed, and that was before Sandy. Sandy um, did a lot of damage to the bulkhead here, and so there's a, at at least $10 million of new damage to, to Pier 40 alone. So we're now looking at um, over $100 million that isn't anywhere. And the mayor isn't giving it, and the governor isn't giving it, and it is not self-sustaining. And, and to me, this really raises a red flag. We're continuing to pour hundreds of millions of dollars in capital into new parks, um, assuming that they're going to then ultimately be self-sustaining. But where's that private money going to come from um, is a real question mark. And I think today the high line is, the, is a cause celeb, but it's the job of an organization like ours to think about 50 years and 100 years ahead. What happens when Diana First, von Furstenberg isn't giving money to the high line anymore and you have this precious park that is super expensive to maintain and you saw what the par neighborhood parks look like, I think that it raises a real question of can this be sustained over time. I'm setting the 20 minutes. <laughs>
So I'm going to be talking about uh, what I sometimes refer to as law's oxymoronic invention, privately owned public space, uh, a grand experiment that started in New York City in 1961 um, when the city gave birth to this hybrid species of public space, uh, POPs, it's sometimes referred to. And it's POPs because it involves private ownership, which continues to reside with the developer and successor owners of the space itself. But by law, the public has access and use. The parent of this conception, this hybrid species that was born, was the New York City 1961 zoning resolution and something called incentive zoning, uh, in which essentially space was traded for space, but it was two different kinds of space the city would allow developers of office and residential towers to build buildings larger than otherwise allowed under the zoning, if in return they agreed to provide public space, plazas, arcades, through block arcades, indoor spaces, and a variety of other typological categories of public space. By quantitative measure, uh, the program in New York City has been a great success. Indeed, as of today, there are roughly, although we don't know exactly, 525 or so privately owned public spaces at about 340 or so commercial and residential towers, principally in downtown, midtown, Upper East Side, and Upper West Sides of the city. Um, by qualitative measure, however, the record is not so rosy. In fact, it's quite mixed. There are good spaces to be sure, but there are a lot of bad spaces. And in addition, there are a lot of privatized spaces, which are bad privatized spaces, although most of the privatized spaces are, in fact, good spaces. Well, the New York story spread around the world, and indeed, not only in the United States do you find privately owned public spaces, but you find them in Tokyo and Osaka and Melbourne and uh, Santiago and London, um, and uh, places everywhere. And the record is actually quite similar. I'm going to be talking about the New York record. And ask the question, why in New York City, and why elsewhere, does this program fail to achieve quite often more than a sort of mixed record? Is it the laws that create the programs and the spaces in New York? Was it the laws administration by city officials? Or, most provocatively, is it in the very DNA of privately owned public space, this odd kind of marriage? Well, luckily for us and for me, we have an actual study that was done that I was involved with, with the New York City Department of City Planning and the Municipal Arts Society of New York. That collaboration resulted in a major research study looking at all of the privately owned public spaces built in New York from 1961 to the year 2000. That research produced a book that I wrote uh, with the assistance of the city and Municipal Arts Society. And finally, that knowledge was taken into action in a variety of arenas with the Department of City Planning and also with a small non-governmental organization called Advocates for Privately Owned Public Space now, based at the Municipal Arts Society. So let me talk about uh, the goals of the study uh, and then show you the work that was actually done. The study that was done at the end of the 1990s, culminating in the year 2000, had two principal goals. First, to establish a baseline of data, and in particular legal data, about the spaces. Unbelievably, the city in the late 1990s and the public at large did not have accurate information about how many privately owned public spaces had been produced pursuant to the zoning resolution. There was an idea, but no complete accurate inventory and no complete and accurate record on what legal obligations attached to the various spaces. Indeed, I suspect and know that many owners were not completely sure about what the obligations were. So the study actually completed that inventory. It was a laborious proce uh, process. I liken it to basically a forensic legal and planning analysis. Imagine going back and figuring out in 1967 what the city did with regard to this space, uh, whether or not uh, chairs or uh, trees or something else were required in, in an indoor space. It was a quite remarkable kind of exercise and one that I will never do again. <laughs> 
the second research methodology involved variations of post-occupancy evaluation, uh, which meant uh, going around and studying the spaces. Uh, the evaluation followed uh, the sort of systematic techniques that have been developed by a lot of researchers, uh, but in particular people like William H. White. Um, I did this post-occupancy evaluation, and it involved visiting every space, that was 503 at that time, privately owned public spaces on multiple occasions at different times, taking photographs at all of the spaces, drawing site plans at all of the spaces, observing and recording user patterns at all of the spaces and interviewing users at all of the spaces, although I should correct myself, I, I couldn't always interview users or observe or record user patterns for the obvious reasons that in a lot of spaces there were no users. And then I interviewed managers and owners, designers, public officials, and community representatives. So as I said, in 2000, 503 privately owned public spaces uh, at 320 commercial and residential buildings. 14 specific legal categories of public space, plazas, residential plazas, urban plazas. After the study, now we have public plazas, covered pedestrian spaces, open air concourses, elevated plazas, through block arcades, arcades, and I could go on and on each of them very specifically and differently defined by law. These 503 privately owned public spaces covered over three and a half million square feet, or 82 acres of land in the city, with a median size of 4,820 square feet. That's altogether roughly 10% of Central Park if you took all of the spaces and put them down on Central Park. It's 30 average city blocks in New York. As I mentioned, most of the spaces uh, are located in middle and upper income areas of the city, uh, office and residential precincts, and that's because of the basic mechanism that produces them. Again, a reliance on the market. So where developers want to build office buildings and residential buildings and really want to build them so much that they want to build more than otherwise allowed, that's where you get a privately owned public space. But you don't get it uh, in other areas of the city where there's no demand for the trigger office or residential tower. And that raises an important equity issue of the geography of privately owned public space, similar to what Holly was talking about with parks in general as to where they are. And what Adrian was talking about, if you want to reproduce Central Park and you know, make sure you've got a centrally located park with millionaires and billionaires who live around it. The city, by the way, granted over 20 million square feet of additional floor area uh, to developers. Uh, for the spaces, of which 16 million square feet uh, was built. That's about eight Empire State Buildings. And one can ask whether the exchange was worth it from society's point of view. That's a whole different kind of question. The study that I did with the city and the Municipal Arts Society looked exclusively at the privately owned public spaces on their own terms, just in and of themselves, not was this bargain worth it. Were these spaces themselves good, notwithstanding that we've got a lot of larger buildings in the city now that go beyond what the zoning originally anticipated? So let's take a look at these spaces. The model for all of this, and the lights can come down, uh, was indeed the Seagram building and that plaza in front of the Seagram building. Uh, that was basically what this was all about. And the Lever House, catty cornered across the street. Indeed, the people who drafted the model for the zoning resolution, the consultants, Voorhees, Walker, Smith, and Smith, literally looked at these spaces um, and put these photographs in their book that was the model for the zoning resolution. So what about these spaces? Well, here they are. This is what you see. This is perhaps the most famous. Let me even take the word perhaps out. This is the most famous privately owned public space probably in the world, certainly in New York City. Zuccotti Park, open to the public, no skateboarding, rollerblading, or bicycling allowed in the park. By the way, this sign doesn't exist anymore, um, as we will see in a moment uh, or in five to 10 minutes. Uh, here's another one, terrific kind of space. There are very good spaces that are used by lots of people. Here's one of my favorites, uh, 590 Madison Avenue, the uh, IBM building, previously called I IBM building. Um, terrific kind of space, uh, well used. This is Zuccotti Park uh, for a moment, a several month moment, very heavily used. 
But this is, this is the bad space. And indeed, uh, in the exercise of reviewing all of the spaces, uh, we classified them into five categories based on, indeed, an evaluation of their usability. A destination space, uh, which is good for users from outside as well as inside the neighborhood, that was 3% of the 503 spaces. A neighborhood space, good for users from the neighborhood within a three block radius, that was 13%. A hiatus space, good for brief stopping, if you want to just sort of stop for a moment, you're on that side of the street, that was 21% of the spaces. Circulation spaces that got you dry from point A to point B more quickly, 18%. Well, you may not have been adding up those percentages, but it leaves for marginal space, which was a political adjective as opposed to the real adjective, which was simply bad space, 41%. 41% of the 503 privately owned public spaces. So this is a plaza. The developer received 10 square feet of rentable space above in its building in return for this space. You can say, what space? Well, if you sort of see the uh, sidewalk line right here, this is bonus plaza space. Uh, this is all bonus plaza space. 10 square feet of floor area in the building for every square feet of that. This is completely legal, bonus, uh, usable uh, plaza space, especially if you wear steel pants. And so is this. This is an arcade, by the way. Three square feet of bonus uh, for every square foot of that arcade. How did that happen? Well, uh, undemanding legal standards uh, are really more at fault than anything else. No one was doing anything wrong at any level, but the developers weren't. A plaza was defined as an open area accessible to the public at all times. Aha, public space. Not less than 10 feet deep, measured from the front lot line. Not at any point more than five feet above, nor more than 12 feet below the curb level of the adjoining street. Well, where's the rest of the definition about the seating and the landscaping and everything? It doesn't exist. In fact, this uh, are, argues for, you know, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, obstructions. The standards were ambiguous. Uh, obstructions generally were not allowed. The idea was to have vacant, open space. So water and arbors were uh, allowed as obstructions, but what about something like this? And, and nobody really knows the answer. Landscaping. Well, that looks nice, but is that really public space? It's visual. It's nice. By the way, this is public space, bonus. This is public space, bonus. A port crochet, you know, really shared. Oh, that's a different spelling. Uh, this is public space. And I'm going to show you this sign. And um, I don't like to read out loud a PowerPoint slide. I think that's sort of not the purpose of, you know, a lecture with PowerPoint. So these are, however, rules of occupancy of the plaza. By the way, it's not a plaza. It's an arcade anyway. It's carelessness. But my favorite uh, line, let me see if I can get to it. Um, it's the second to last line. <laughs> and yep, that's right. If you provide something like that, that's what you're going to get. Um, look, there was a very hazy conception of public space from the beginning. The idea was to have a visual kind of space sitting in front of towers, the so-called tower in the park, tower in the plaza model. But uh, this is what you get. Now, we have an exciting experiment that occurred from 1961 to the present, which is in 1975 and thereafter, zoning reforms that were introduced by the Department of City Planning starting in 1975 and continuing through the remarkable administration of Amanda Burden, who currently heads the City Planning Department, introduced tougher, better legal standards and those standards dramatically improved the quality of public space in terms of usability. Indeed, there's a chronological fault line that's very easy to see starting in 1975. So signs would be required. Functional amenities, one linear foot of seating for every 30 square feet of plaza. Landscaping, trees, bike racks, drinking fountains, and the spaces are just much, much nicer and much more used. And that leads to the irony of the second major finding of the study. 
And that's a finding that a substantial number of spaces have been out of compliance with applicable legal requirements in ways resulting in privatization of the public space. And based on field surveys that were conducted in 1998 and 99 of all privately owned public spaces, roughly half, 50% of all buildings with a space had a space apparently out of compliance with applicable legal requirements in ways resulting in some degree of privatization. This is what I call privatization uh, through operation. And it is indeed those 1975 and beyond spaces that end up being privatized. The better initially designed spaces are overrepresented in this class. Why? Well, higher quality begets use. Use begets owner backlash, and owner backlash begets privatization. Um, it's very, very hard, by the way, to really need to privatize the initial spaces, the bad spaces, because people tend not to use them anyway. So they're privatized by, in fact, design. Well, the mechanisms of privatization fell into three major categories and continue to this day. Uh, the first one is denial of access. So uh, here's, uh, you know, something that's just nothing. It's not a public space. It's still not a public space. It just became a public space. And that's the space. To have that in a dense city like New York is a great amenity for people. Obstructions are, are denial of access. This is Trump Tower. Uh, there are privately owned public spaces on the fourth and fifth levels of Trump Tower. In fact, the entire retail space is a privately owned public space. I know most people thought it was a retail mall, vertical retail mall, and I could say more about it. But in fact, it is a privately owned public space. The building is larger than it otherwise would have been. There are open spaces outdoor on the fourth and fifth levels. Go to them, you'll get into one. Normally, the other is normally locked. Um, obstructions. This is the back of that water element I showed you. And, uh, you know, you place that there and nobody can walk along. I did because I climbed over. Um, you know, this was up for two years. They were waiting for a part for the escalator that took you up to this elevated plaza. It was coming over from Germany on the slow boat. Um, hmm, hard to read. There's actually a plaque there, an identification sign. But it's behind vines. Not anymore. This one, you know, today is covered. It's another Trump building. I mean, it's not Donald Trump. That's not the point. But, uh, you know, here the law was careless. Didn't specify really where the signs had to go, that they always had to be uh, visible. Uh, second category, denial of access. Second is annexation of public safe space by adjacent private uses. I call this brasserie bulge, cafe creep, or trotteria trickle. You can use whatever alliteration you want. But the point is that users must pay for a meal or for a drink or something in order to use the space. Uh, this, is, this is illegal. There was a whole restaurant. This is, by the way, where the Apple Store is now in New York, for those of you who know, across from the Plaza Hotel, right next to Central Park, southeast corner. There was a, a restaurant just sitting here for years and years and years, 100% illegal, right smack in the middle of a privately owned public space. No one did anything about it. It's sort of like, well, I don't get that. Um, Bendel's Department Store. Uh, I'm going to now show you a space that's supposed to be free of all retail sales activity. There is. It's a department store. Look, I love department stores on Fifth Avenue. But, uh, you know, let's, let's be clear. Now, the rules have now been changed on this so that now it's been legalized. But for years and years, it was illegally occupying that space. Um, and illegally, by the way, placing uh, some of its uh, wares of sale in front of Rene Lalique windows, which were supposed to be completely unobstructed. Um, finally, diminution of required amenities. Here are spikes. These spikes are illegal, unlike the spikes I showed you originally. Um, and that bench there, that was a required amenity in Trump Tower. It's now, there's a sort of Trump sales area here, and the bench is actually gone. Look, properly provided, these spaces do remarkable things uh, for people. We've got challenges, to be sure. Today, the security challenge is very, very real, and it's changed the nature of uh, privately owned public space. And then um, Occupy Wall Street reminded us that there were other uses beyond, beyond the sort of casual recreational leisure, leisure uses of them. So here's that sign that I showed you before. Uh, here's the new sign. You know, and they could have just said, no Occupy 
you know, use of the space, and it would have been much, much, much uh, clearer. So look, at the end of the day, there's an inherent tension in Law's oxymoronic invention of privately owned public space that cuts against the public interest. Commercial and residential building owners providing them in New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Melbourne, and Santiago, and everywhere, they're doing it to get the bonus, to get the extra floor area. They're not doing it because they want to provide public space. Okay, fine, that's the deal if we're gonna do this dance with the devil. And it applies not just to privately owned public space too, but to other kinds of things. So you really have to be very, very careful in the sorts of laws that take into realistic account the tension between private ownership and public use. Legal clarity and specificity are necessary because letter of the law compliance by developers will be the norm. Monitoring and enforcement must be institutionalized in advance. I like to say, to plan as human, to follow up divine. A lot of follow up. Get the documentation, the monitoring. The equity issue of public space exists here. And multiple publics need to think about and be encouraged to take stewardship of this asset that we have in whatever cities. So people ask me, well, are you for them or against them? Well, I've made a nice academic limiting off of them. Uh, I'm sort of, uh, and I do have actually an answer. I do see potential benefits to be realized in harnessing private capital for the public good through public-private partnerships. Um, in my more hyperbolic moments, I refer to these spaces as a decentralized central park. But it requires intelligently conceived and carefully implemented design, law, and stewardship. To achieve this, it's a task fraught with added complexity when public and private interests are yoked together to serve the public good. Thank you very much. Are we on? Yes. Um, so I'm sure you all have questions. No questions? Uh, we think privatization is done uh, by designers uh, trying to control and limit use by designing things that are more to look at than to be used. And that was done a lot in those plazas. I studied those plazas with Holly White. And you could quickly tell whether the design was meant to be used or not to be used. Uh, what do you think about that? Like Brooklyn Bridge Park Pier 6, you know, with a perched wetland and isolated little enclaves of, par of parks where one is a swing set and the other one is a slide and then some water and a removed... You know, it's not cross-generational. -gener it, it has this kind of narrow... Uh, use and narrow outcomes. And Fred, are you addressing it to the whole? Yes, uh, to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I think a successful design um, will you know, stay successful you know, no matter what the sort of trends are for how people want to enjoy parks. I mean, I think a perfect example is Central Park, where nobody who sort of strolled the widening paths and the hoop skirts and you know, full you know, full suits in 1880 could have foreseen the days of people running around in lycra underwear. <clears throat> but, and yet, it's still a successful park. You know, I, I, I would disagree with you vehemently about Brooklyn Bridge Park. I think Brooklyn Bridge Park Pier is, six. is a spectacular design throughout the park. Um, well, Pier, which, which part of Pier 6? The whole part. The entire park. Look at the buildings. You can't, if you think there's a restaurant there. Well, the restaurant a, isn't there yet. But it was well, it was there. last year. But it was, um, it's very popular. You go there at sunset, people are playing volleyball, and there are parents out, and it's, it's the most crowded, most successful playground in the history of playground design. So you know, I, 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 I view Brooklyn Bridge Park as being a huge success. We could, we could have a good debate, but, but <laughs> others well, are. But they're, they're, I mean, the, it's the... You know, you design a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door. It's standing room only in those playgrounds from morning to night. So, I go there every day. I mean, day. You, you may view it as not being a success, but everybody who uses it thinks, I wish I had a 
playground like this in my neighborhood. Right, right place, right. microphone. And introduce yourself also. And that was Fred Kent of Project for Public Spaces. Peter, please. Uh, Peter Marcus from Columbia. Um, it seems to me there's an underlying issue that, that um, all three of the presentations raised, but nobody has discussed squarely. It's the concept of spatial justice. These are all discussions basically of what's happened in Manhattan in New York. And the question of um, whether there isn't a public uh, concern about the equality of the, of the parks, of the uh, public spaces that result among the different the different geographic areas of the city needs to be discussed. You can either ignore it, as, uh, as it seems to me Adrian did in, in his presentation, or you can refer to it but figure that you have to live with the law as it is, or you could reject the idea entirely. Um, Living with the law as it is, there, there is an alternative that hasn't been mentioned, and that is spreading the benefit uh, uh, spatially across the city. There was an argument, for instance, about whether public school parent-teachers associations could uh, pay privately for giving music instruction in the public schools. And the resolution is yes, but Half of the contribution has to go to the Board of Education for the provision of equal uh, services in other parts of the city. And I wonder whether that couldn't be done both on the self-sustaining that you can't just do Central Park, half of that has to go to the rest of the city or whatever. And even perhaps with the privately owned public spaces that, uh, that Part of that benefit has to go to other parts of the city. Uh. I, I, I'll take the, the first part. I think that that is a, a viable idea. And I think it was difficult when this came up a lot. It's interesting. It didn't come up when the first big Highline gift of $20 million was given, but it came up a lot after the $100 million to Central Park. Um, and the thinking was, well, there, it's this donor. You can't. You, and, and the sort of argument from the city is, he was on the Central Parks Board, we couldn't, we couldn't do that. Now, I think that now that that's been out there, we absolutely could create that kind of fund, and in the future, it would be, everyone would be on notice that those kinds of gifts would have some percentage that would go toward a, a community fund. And there are discussions in the city, and we're part of those discussions, about something like that happening now. Um, the flip side argument that we hear is, is is twofold. One is that will deter donors. I'm not sure, I'm not a wealthy enough person to understand if that's true or not, but I tend to think it's not. Um, the other is that no one says when somebody is going to give money to the Metropolitan Museum or to a hospital that they have to give a percentage of it to the Veterans Hospital or to you know the Queens Museum and not Metropolitan. And so it kind of raises the question, are parks somehow inherently different than other cultural institutions, if you will? I, I would argue that yes, as public space, they, they are, and that, and that this probably is a model that should be piloted and tested, and, and let's see if donors are, are truly um, you know, frozen in their actions. My guess is probably not. Yeah, I was just wondering, whenever a well-designed, oh, I'm Heather Remoff, I'm just an interested citizen. Um, you I, don't have to say just. <laughs> I was wondering, it seems to me that whenever a well-designed public space is created, that the site values of the property around it go up. And I wonder if, for example, in New York, there's any attempt to look at land value and recapture that increase in, in site value through some kind of a land value tax that could be dedicated to parks 
not just that particular park, but other parks. Is there any attempt to do that? That, that is my question. Do you, I mean, I can, but do you want, why don't you? Well, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, some cities have a, a tax just for parks. So the city of Chicago is the Chicago Parks District, and they, just like many cities or towns, collect an extra tax for your schools. Chicago collects an extra tax for um, parks, which is great. And so many park systems say, this is a wonderful thing, and um, I wish we had this. The problem is that you're limited to just those taxes that you collect. And if the, if the rate doesn't go up, you're, uh, you, you only have that amount of money, and it can't be changed. Now, the issue of whether you could say, um, say for example, around the High Line or around Hudson River Park, your property values have gone up, therefore we should take part of the increased value from your properties and put it toward other parks. That's a really interesting question. And in fact, because of the troubles they've had at Hudson River Park, where they're not getting any tax dollars at all going into maintenance of the park, they've said, we'd like to have the property owners form the equivalent of a business improvement district here. So for the three blocks going east of Hudson River Park, everybody pays a little bit of money, an extra, a, like a bid fee, but would go to the park and to the medians on the street because there is no public money going to the park. So they're looking at it on a local basis. So you could look at a local basis, you could look at a citywide basis. Um, it's very tricky to collect taxes from residential properties, extra taxes, because you have different kinds of residential properties. You have co-ops, condos, and rental buildings. Yeah, but, but the, based on the land, but the, the owner of a rental building cannot pass on increased taxes to the tenants of a rent-controlled, rent-stabilized building, which is a big issue. So it's, it's a very tricky issue, but it, it, that might be one, in fact, a smart way of looking at how to get some kind of equity there. And, and, and I think just in the idea of, of sharing the wealth, I fully agree. I think the, the trustees of, trust of Harvard University should take half of that $34 billion endowment and give it to University of Massachusetts. What, what about what about Columbia? Columbia, sorry. I just I want to add one thing on to uh, Adrian was talking about the the neighborhood improvement district concept. I think it's it that was floated in the High Line and rejected by the neighbors um, at the High Line, and it's there's a ton of pushback in Tribeca right now for the Hudson River Park, and and I think it's a really interesting question. Now they have this beautiful park, and both in relatively well-to-do areas and the neighborhood feels very entitled and very upset about now having this assessment that might be imposed on them. Um, I think it's, it's been, when bids have worked, it's because like in Bryant Park and Madison Square Park, the parks were in terrible condition. And then people came in and wanted a beautiful park. It's very difficult to impose it after you have something and feel entitled to have that public asset. My name is Camilla Ween. I'm a former Loeb Fellow and I live in London. I'm currently researching a project to establish urban quality indicators to actually look at the public realm and to be able to evaluate scientifically how good that space is or not. One of the things we saw a lot when I was advising the Mayor of London on the quality of developments that were coming forward, we had very scientific methods for evaluating the quality of the buildings. When we looked at the public space, it was, well, if the pretty pictures were pretty, it was fabulous public realm. If the pictures were lousy, it was crap. And there was no science behind it whatsoever. So I'm thinking, if you have a set of indicators that you look at the same sustainability, the accessibility, does it support community, so on, would that have helped, A, in the particularly the projects that you, Gerald Caden, spoke about in New York as they were coming forward for development, but also... Could you somehow use those indicators post if the, if it falls into decline, and it and it's obviously as most of those places you mentioned, could could you use them sort of retrospectively to force the landowners to upgrade or to commit to what they originally committed to? Yes. So I think the answer is yes to everything you've just said. I think indicators are very important, and indeed I'm going to be talking a little bit about this uh, tomorrow. Uh, morning when I uh, have another 15 minutes uh, to talk more generally about uh, public space. Um, I, I think there wasn't really any science at all, and we can talk about what we mean by science behind the first series of clauses that were provided. The science was basically, we want to have a space in front of a tower. It was, again, the tower in the plaza model that was 
the Seagram model, which was pre the zoning, and the Lieberhaus model, which was pre the zoning. That was literally what this was about. So I don't think anybody really thought, and I don't want to give the little story until tomorrow of sort of proving that, nobody really thought about public use with these public spaces, and yet they were open and accessible to the public. So they were just meant to be pictures that were setting the building off right there. Um, Holly White, William H. White, came along and did uh, some degree of science. And there's a dispute about how scientific it all is, but he began to observe certain phenomenons and correlated, you know, chairs with people sitting, you know, that kind of simple kind of thing. And that's been taken forward by Project for Public Spaces and many others, uh, you know, in, as indicators. Uh, some people think they're, they're not sophisticated enough. Others think they're very, very good, and let's march forward with them. I think the answer is, uh, historically in New York, it wouldn't have made a difference, uh, but that's because of the phenomenon of why these spaces were originally created. I think today, going forward, uh, absolutely, that kind of thing helps to design criteria and legal standards for better spaces. And then applying them as post-occupancy evaluation, again, the only way you do that is to have some degree of criteria. The issue is, if you identify a bad space, but it's legal, what are you going to do? And that requires a whole different set of policy uh, actions. Um, my name is Alex Sulem, and I was wondering if some of these conservancies and trusts that run these places these privately owned public spaces, if their interests somehow, in some ways, might become divorced from the that of the general public or other stakeholders. For example, the Friends of the High Line, um, there was a, these developers in the Chelsea markets adjacent to the High Line are expanding, they want to expand their building and they've, they went to get zoning rights from the city to expand. But many of the people in the neighborhood were opposed to it. In fact, it seemed like the Friends of the High Line were the only people that voted for it and the developers were going to give the friends $20 million. The city finally brokered a deal where they're they going to give a third of that and devote it towards um, public housing and, um, and uh, youth groups. But these development agencies, they're, I mean, the, the conservancies, they're getting money from people, from concessions and also from um, real estate interests alongside. So. Do they have some type of conflict of interest there? Um, well, uh, interesting question. Um, you know, if you looked at the pictures of the park systems of New York, which could have been the pictures of park systems of other cities in the 1970s when there, were, when there was no private involvement in the parks, you had a government, government was taking care of the parks using taxpayer money, and they were doing a really piss poor job of it. And I can say that as a public employee and somebody who was working there. Um, and there was no accountability. And, and there was no law. There, was, there were no, you know, many public services are governed by, by laws or court decisions, civil service regulations um, uh, you know, that say you must have certain types of services provided by government. There were, there's no law that says a park needs to be kept clean or that it must be a, a gardener for every 10 acres or a, an attendant to clean every sandbox. So you had this t terrible eroding away of, of standards, and then it's only with the advent of some of these public-private partnerships that the concept of standards has returned. And an interesting thing has happened. As parks got better, people in neighborhoods that didn't have a conservancy said, I want my neighborhood to look like that too. So um, whether that had an impact or not, the city of New York ended up spending hundreds of millions of dollars fixing up parks that were not downtown, that were in far Rockaway or in Inwood or in the South Bronx, um, and then taking some of the lessons that were learned with some of the private groups of um, saying, okay, we need to have zone gardeners. You need to have a gardener for every few parks in each neighborhood, and that turned out to be a pretty good success. But then how do you sustain that? You know, it's, it's really hard to sustain. So here at the High Line, you could say, um, you know, this was a, it's a bad idea to let the friends of the High Line keep the revenue from the cafes there. Um, on the other hand, those revenues, um, enable the place to be maintained. We had five million visits a year. People visit New York just to go to the High Line, the same way they go just to go to the Metropolitan Museum. And there has, there's record tourism. You say, well, that's unfortunate. If you walk around the streets of New York, you can barely get around. But it's great for jobs. And you know, one of the few growth sectors in the last few years for unskilled labor has been hotels and restaurants. And many of those are union jobs. So when you get 52,000 
tourists visiting New York every year, that's a huge big deal. And if part of that is coming to, to see parks and recreational spaces, that's a really good thing. And, and, and a final thought is there's, a, I think, a misplaced notion that um, Central Park and Prospect Park, which are supported in large measure by private dollars, are parks for rich people. And I would say for those of you who believe that, you should go to Central Park on July 4th and see who's actually using the park and see that at one end of Central Park is East Harlem and Harlem, which last time I checked was not exactly wealthy people. A lot of working people and poor people living in public housing projects who get to enjoy a spectacular park. So um, there's no means test to use these parks. And you know, my, my argument would be, yes, you, some parks will be much better. You know, Madison Square Park is very well taken care of and St. James Park in the Bronx not so well taken care of. But because there's no city dollars going to take care of Madison Square Park, the scarcity dollars can go to St. James Park in, in the Bronx. And um, that when you have this effect of lifting up the quality of some parks, everybody wants better parks. And in fact, the parks of New York and many parks around the country have improved a great deal because it's more of a, people have now seen, oh, parks can be nice and we want nice parks. But I do think you hit exactly on the conundrum, which is what happens when the conservancy's goals or their pressures aren't aligned with public. And I think that is where there has to be vigilance. And I, I think that the Lincoln Center is, the ba is one of the really prime examples where Lincoln Center is not there because they care about that park. They're there because they care about Lincoln Center and keeping it open and keeping it sustained. And that park is sort of, you know, is, is raising money on behalf. And obviously that's, I think, a place where there's not an alignment between what the Conservancy's goals are and the, and the public's at large. They feel that those RFPs would overdevelop um, Pier 40 and that that would change the quality of the park and also change the well, Hudson River or Park or is complicated right. because yeah. the legislation is. Well, legislative. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the RFPs failed because Hudson River Park decided they didn't like the responses, and because the legislation is too limiting as to what the uses can be. The there, there was no public vote about it. It was, it was the board itself deciding we don't like the proposals we got. They're not really going to do what the park needs. But people were very opposed to them too. I think and some are very much pressure. for them. I mean, there's yeah. a mix of public opinion. The Marcuse rule. I'm Barbara Cos Paley, Art Assets. My question is about tension. And I think if we look at the High Line as an example, it took 20 years of wanting to tear it down and a group of citizens that got together to fight for it and to keep it. And I think that tension is very, very important to how we think about public spaces, how we use them, how they're used by not just the public that lives around them, but how they become destination and part of community. Community is international today. So I'd like you to talk about a little bit of the tension that goes into um, the making of public spaces and the remaking of public spaces and recycling detrius that we have. Uh, we have a viaduct that goes around um, the 230 Park and the Pan Am building. We're looking at rezoning that piece of Manhattan, 78 blocks. What's the tension that's going to create um, a wonderful space for those of us who live around there and work around there and those of us who come to New York City for work or play? I, th I think that, the, that those kinds of tensions and moments of high anxiety around a space like a Zuccotti Park, in the end, they end up making for a much richer public space. And I think certainly the Zuccotti Park situation has brought renewed visibility on privately owned public space and, and what, do, what are those supposed to be and should they be regulated and how should they be regulated and who gets to use them. Um, an example that's going on right now in New York is um, there are three development proposals in and around Flushing Meadow uh, Corona Park, which is um, not in one of these wealthy neighborhoods, the largest park in Queens that does not have a conservancy, and it's suddenly making people think, why would we talk about alienating 13 acres of parkland for a major league soccer stadium here? And there's a lot of discussions now. Nobody would do that in Central Park. Nobody would do that in Prospect Park. And I think that the tension that some of those kinds of use questions raise end up making for better spaces because it brings stewardship. And where people don't care about their spaces, 
they don't get the spaces they deserve. And I think stewardship is one of the biggest things that comes out of those moments of tension. But at the end of the day, I think we, we can't divorce public space from the development of a city writ large. And all of the claims that are apparent every single time a new building is proposed or any action is taken, um, and the arguments and the conflicts, and we know what those interests are, also appear when public space is at issue. So in a funny way, public space is something that we're focused on. We're going to be spending you know, the next hour and a half plus all day tomorrow as we end this panel now. Uh, but in a way, we have to remember it's just, you know, it's that same contestation that we have in cities worldwide. And it's a remarkable story that's repeated again and again and again with different outcomes depending on the history, culture, economics of that city. But it's not necessarily dramatically different from many of those other battles. Susan. Do I get one last question? Nope, we're at the we're end. We're at the end. All right, so thank, thank our panelists. And um, yes. Yeah. Yeah.